Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Todd Capone, who is just outside Chicago in blistering 40 degree weather. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's uh, it's unbelievable. Like, like I said, we're going to be running through the sprinkler this afternoon. It's the first time it's gotten to that temp in a long time. Excellent, excellent. And Todd is the author of the Transparency Sale, and you call yourself, I think, it's the Transparency Nerd. Is that right? Yeah, it's a uh, Transparency Nerd, but uh, it's basically behavioral and decision yeah. science nerdery. Right. Okay. Well, let's let's uh, let's jump straight into it. So, just baseline it for the audience. When you talk about transparency in in selling, what do you mean? Well, why don't I start with a little story and it'll yeah. help lay the foundation for it. I, essentially what happened um, in my last role, I was the chief revenue officer of a company called Power Reviews. Mm -hmm. You can probably guess what they do. They help retailers collect and display ratings and reviews on their website, right? right. And we did a research study with Northwestern University that looked at, all right, when a website's acting as a salesperson, what do people do? And the results came back first thing that came out was no surprise. Like we all look at reviews today. So no surprise there. But there was two things that jumped out at me that caused me to eventually quit my job and write a book, like mm -hmm. that, that kind of insanity. One of them was that 85% of us read the negative reviews first. So you're going to buy something, you skip past the fives and read the fours, yeah. threes, twos, and ones. And that when a product has an average review score between a four, two and a four, five, so average, that's actually optimal for conversion, meaning a product that has a 4.2, a 4.3, a 4.4 will actually sell at a higher conversion rate than a product that's got nothing but perfect five-star reviews. And I'm looking at that going, all right, that's when a website's acting as a salesperson. What happens in real life in human-to-human -human selling? Is that mm -hmm. a behavioral science thing or is it just because it's online? And it turns right. out all of the behavioral science points to this idea that imperfection and transparency actually sells better than perfection. It's leading with your flaws. If 85% of us are going to the negative reviews online, it's actually a satisfier, it disarms the buying brain. And when we can do that in human to human selling where we actually lead with, hey, this is what you might not like, or here's something that a competitor maybe does better than us, or here's a price point that sometimes customers get a little concerned about, let's address those things up front. You build trust, you speed sales cycles, you win more often, you work the deals you should be working. And if you're going to lose, you lose faster. So transparency, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's authenticity, which is a different word. There's an association to it. Authenticity is like being your true self. Transparency is, hey, cards face up on the table. I'm here to help you make the right decision. I'm here to help you understand what the pros and the cons are of going with us so that we help get you into the right solution as quickly as possible. That's right. transparency. And let's face it, I mean, that's kind of counterintuitive to the way a lot of people sell where they are you know, desperately trying to um, downplay anything that may derail the sale or if there's a weakness in the product or service or somebody does anything to try and you know relegate that down to something unimportant so that it, it's very it, it's a very counterintuitive approach and how would you see somebody I mean how would you see that playing out in in reality and what's your what's your experience been well yeah I'll tell you first uh, based on your last comment I, I'm also a sales history nerd Mm -hmm. And I know that's weird, but like I have, there's a book like this is 1916's The Art and Science of Selling. It smells fantastic, by the way, like if you ever want to, but um, they knew that transparency sold better than perfection back then. I mean, even in 1920, there's a quote um, in a book by Arthur Dunn that says, if the truth won't sell it, don't sell it. Like, well, yeah, right. But now mm -hmm. we've entered this era that we've always known transparency sells better than perfection. But we have to do it because of the proliferation of reviews and feedback on everything we do buy and experience. You can't hide your flaws and expect to get away with it anyway. So right. here's uh, two little things that happened when you ask about like, how do we actually see this playing out? One was I had just discovered all this research. So I'm, I'm going, all right, 
I think this might work. I happened to be in New York. I had a couple of days of meetings and all of a sudden I had a big window just cancel on me. So I'm hanging out in New York, nothing to do. My VP of sales reports to me, uh, texts me and he's like, Todd, we just got a big apparel manufacturer lead, uh, you know, retailer. I'm like, oh, cool. So I called him up because I'm bored and said, tell me about it. And he said, well, they're going to issue an RFP. And then based on that, they're going to have us come to New York and do the full dog and pony show. And I was like, New York. Oh, that's right. They're here in New York. I know this is a one in 50 shot, but can you just have the rep reach out to their head of e-commerce? Tell them I'm here and I've got a couple hours open if he wants to grab some coffee. Mm -hmm. And so they did. And the one in 50 shot happened. The guy said, yes. So I go check in, go to his office. This dude was like New York in the best way possible. Like there was no mm -hmm. small talk. We walk into his office. So I, again, under the premise of thinking this is going to be coffee, I walk in, he points to his monitor, hands me the HDMI cord and said, here, you can plug in your laptop here for your presentation. I'm like, <laughs> Pre presentation? And as I'm messing with that, people are rolling chairs into the office and not just people, seven of them. So now there's nine of us in this little Manhattan office. It's the summer, it was hot. And um, this guy starts by just saying, hey, listen, we're looking at your competitor. We're looking at you how are you better? Mm -hmm. And you know, you can see everybody just kind of arms up, just like, all right, here comes the sales pitch. And so I decided, gosh, I got nothing. I'm just going to try it. I didn't prepare a presentation anyway. So I said, hey, listen, before we get too deep into this, our competitor who you mentioned, they actually just released something that not only do we not have, but it's not even on our roadmap. Now, if that's going to be an important consideration, can we address that now before I mean, you got a lot of people in here, they're going to spend all kinds of time on an RFP. We're going to be flying people around. Like, why don't we address what could be the showstoppers now before we get too deep into it? And he's like, what's, what's the thing they released? I explained it like I was selling on behalf yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Right, of our competitor. And they quickly, after a few minutes of kind of debating it back and forth, they're like, yeah, that's not something we would go to a reviews provider for anyway. And if we want it, we know we can address it. Here's what like blew my mind. 10 minutes later, after I talked about the fact that, hey, we give that up so we can be great at our core. And I start talking the positives. He kicks the other people out, pulls a folder off his credenza, opens it, it's got his budget. Like I've never had a customer actually show me their real budget, fifth line down, wow. it has the dollar amount. He's like, can you hit that? And we had a discussion on that. 10 days later, I get a call they decided not to do the RFP. They decided not to fly anybody around. And he was calling to tell me that they had decided to just go for us uh, because they felt comfortable. And you know, they basically by being transparent, my theory is we laid the foundation for them to be able to predict what their experience is gonna be like, both the pros mm -hmm. and the cons. And they didn't need yeah. to do that whole decision-making process because we got them to that point faster. That, that's an example of how this could play out in real life. Yeah, you know, and, and, and it's a fascinating example. And obviously, it takes, you know, some level of, of confidence. But I think basically what you outlined there is throughout that process, there, the meeting and that and, you know, turning up and doing all that stuff is you built a level of trust, because you didn't try to go down. I mean, you basically did them the courtesy of saying, let me save you your time and energy, just in case this is something that's not going to work for you. Well, yeah, and part of it is, would I rather that come from me where I can mm -hmm. control the message or yeah. would I rather that come from them and I pretend like, oh, it's not a big, why would you like, and I'm trying to sell them on why it's not important. That's that's not the point. Mm -hmm. And again, when we think that 85% of us go to the negative reviews first, because we're wired to know that perfection isn't a real thing. It's just like the way that we're, like, we can't predict if we believe that what we're hearing isn't reality. And so that's why just leading with, hey, here's just one thing that might not be a fit. I want to control that message and I want to build, use it to build trust. And that's, that's exactly what we do. And, you know, one of the examples I often talk about is like, if you think about even, uh, I'm sure you've been to an Ikea before, but uh -huh. You know, Ikea is the number one furniture retailer in the world for 13 straight years, and it sucks. Mm -hmm. 
right? Like you can't find anything. You got to write down the code because you're going to the warehouse to pull the boxes onto a cart that doesn't have brakes, jam it into your car, Tetris style, get it home, assemble it with 150 parts and no words on the instructions. And like, yeah. you know, 30 F-bombs later, you get the endorphin rush and you're like, gosh, I should have bought the end tables with this bedroom mm -hmm. furniture. Ikea doesn't hide that, right? They tell the world, hey, listen, we're going to give up that experience so we can give you modern Scandinavian design furniture you didn't pay much for. And that's incumbent on all of us in our professions to understand here's what we do well and here's what we give up to be great at that core. Understand who your target is, understand the different scenarios and help the customer predict by leading with the things that might not work out. And the magic on the back end is amazing. Yeah. And though I IKEA does give you uh, 52 extra Allen wrenches that you're never going to use again. So there's exactly. always a bonus in there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And um, they've got the Swedish meatballs too. So yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But it is it is interesting because what you're talking about here is, as you said, with with human nature and human psychology, it's like when you engage in a sales process with somebody and with the engage with the salesperson. You kind of, whether you like it or not, you're kind of always looking for the catch, right? I mean, we're kind of hardwired that way. So we're looking for, okay, what's wrong with this? What, what, could, what could possibly be? What could they be hiding? What could maybe not work? There's a lot of things like that that, uh, that come into play. And I guess what you're doing is you're meeting people where they are psychologically. That, that's exactly it. It's our we're wired to try to predict. We are wired mm -hmm. to understand what the expectations are. You know, one uh, side example of that is you know, right around the holidays, you know, my wife and I, I got a, a two kids, eight and 10. And we were out, my wife suggested ice cream. And so the kids hear that and they're like, ice cream, like, let's go, mm -hmm. right? So we, we go, there's a place called Culver's that they have here in uh, the Chicago area. It's kind of like in and out, but uh, they've got frozen custard, which is heavenly. Right. We, uh, we've got an expectation that we're going to be able to go get in the drive through and grab it and go. We pull in and there's 15 cars in the drive through window, or, you know, in line there. And so we look at it, we're like, oh, now we get in line because we'd already committed. The kids want mm -hmm. the reward. And within a couple of minutes, my 10 year old says, hey, can we just go home? Like we, it's not this bit, like we don't need, it, it's not worth waiting for. And my eight-year-old's yeah. like, I just want to go play Minecraft. Like, let's go. So we pull out a line. We choose the status quo over the, uh, the frozen customer, yeah. right? And it, that's also part of our role in the sales world is to set proper expectations because, you know, there are times where you will wait in line. If there's like the greatest taco mm -hmm. shop in the world and there's always a line, you get there and the line's not that bad, you think it's a reward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We think about this in our own selling environment where our part of our job is to set expectations because once we start to miss the expectation that is set, our brain is wired. It actually biases our perception of the reward. And so in all of these cases, if we set a bar that's really high and then we start adding in these little things that, oh, you're not going to like, oh, we don't do this. Oh, all of a sudden it's like the, the Culver's line where we suddenly get out and we choose the status quo over that reward there. And it's the exact same thing in like, you know, the, the real world, you probably all experienced it. Our role yeah. is to set proper expectations, embrace what you're not great at. And when you do, magic happens in your sales process. Yeah, it does. and it does. And and the thing that you're um, alluding to there, and I think is the thing that a lot of people struggle with, like, yeah, it, it, it's, it sucks losing to a competitor, right? But in many ways, it sucks even more losing to a no decision, just like you said, like pulling out of the line and, and, and that, and that happens more and more, and particularly in the environment that we're in right now, because people are so leery and so reluctant to spend money and they don't want to make mistakes and everything. So the status quo, even though the status quo is not really status quo anymore, that seems to be pretty appealing to people. So any opportunity you give somebody to make a no decision, they'll normally take it. Well, and I'll tell you, um, consensus selling is hard, of course, like we all know mm -hmm. that. Consensus buying is harder. Because yeah. we never do it. We don't have a whole organization behind us to help us buy. Remote consensus buying is even harder. Like your buyers, 
don't have the opportunity to just walk down the hallway and go, hey, John, like, hey, I'm going to do or run into you when I'm getting coffee. So that is contributing to it. That is the equivalent of the 15 cars in the drive in mm. is our buyers. Their world has gotten harder. Consensus building has gotten harder. And we've got to have a clinical level of empathy for that. What kinds of things can we do to help them reduce homework and help them build consensus? Reducing the homework, transparency. Now, there's other ideas and ways to think about how do we reduce the perception of the drive through line, right? Yeah. Like, we've got to look at our sales processes and go, all right, where is their friction here? And how can we reduce that? And in the areas that we can't, we should be leading with setting that expectation for the customer. Like, hey, as we go through, like, here's a mutual decision plan. Here's the steps you're probably going to need to take and help them with that journey. There's also, you know, how do we use video downstream in our sales processes to help the buyers build consensus? We've got to be highly empathetic to the fact that consensus buying has gotten incredibly harder in the last 12 months. And our job is to help facilitate that. Yeah, I know. And I think that's an excellent point. And I think that's where a lot of people have struggled. Uh, because as you said, uh, they we don't know what's going on on the on the customer side. And and maybe that's something that we should be asking more about early early in the process, like saying, you know, what's your buying process like? Has your buying how has your buying process been impacted? You know, during the pandemic, is it extend? You know, the more people involved, does it take longer? All of these things would would give us greater greater insight. But um, unfortunately, I I think sometimes like we're just so glad to get somebody to talk to that we just hope it's going to be a smooth process and we don't even want to ask those questions. Right, exactly. And it's like, again, if you're going to lose, you want to lose fast, right? Like we mm -hmm. all say that. I think there's sales leaders out there like myself. In my last role, I did this wrong. I used to measure pipeline load over, you know, over other things, meaning if a rep didn't yeah. have 4X their quota and pipeline, well, you're not prospecting enough. Well, that's stupid because we're, we're actually incentivizing subconsciously reps to go fill their pipelines with crap. So the boss doesn't go, hey, you're not prospecting enough. We've got to create environments where our reps are better at qualifying in and out faster and looking at these deals that we lose slowly in and say, hey, what could we have recognized earlier in these processes so that we can spend our more time, our time more efficiently on the deals that we should win. And like I said, with that example of the apparel uh, manufacturer in New York, man, wouldn't it have sucked if we would have gone through a whole sales process, filled out RFPs and lost because of the add-on? Like that, yes. that would kill us <laughs> when we could have addressed it up front and we did. And then even if it does become an issue later on, the customer almost subconsciously is like, yeah, but we're not going to bring that up. Yeah, right? exactly. That was our fault. We made that choice. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So there's so much value to losing fast. And it all kind of comes down to this expectation setting, setting clinical levels of empathy and leading with transparency. Yeah. And, and I think it's interesting when you say clinical levels of, of empathy, because obviously empathy has become a big buzzword lately. I mean, obviously empathy has been around forever, but in terms of say, like if everybody's talking, oh, you've got to be empathetic. And when you say clinical empathy, what do you mean by that? Because I do think that sometimes people are trying to figure out like, okay, how do I come across? How do I be empathetic? How do I come across as empathetic? And it's not, and it's not really something you can fake. Right. Yeah. They, I think most people's definition of empathetic is actually sympathetic. Yes. And those are, those are two different words, right? Empathetic mm -hmm. is to actually be able to understand what it's like in their world. You know, the, the really, I guess this is a bad example, uh, but you know, imagine um, you and a buddy are going to get on a flight and you've got to fly somewhere and you've got work to do on the way. And right before, uh, you know, before you're getting ready to leave for the airport, you look at the seat assignments and see that your buddy is back row middle. Mm -hmm. Now, the, what we call empathy that is actually sympathetic is to go, oh man, that sucks. Oh, mm -hmm. I, I can't, that, that's going to be really hard for you. And I, I get it. Mm -hmm. Like I, clinical levels of empathy would be to take my, uh, my stepdaughter's hatchback and go get in the back seat and like pull it out across the street so that you're right at the edge of, of Wi-Fi. So your Wi-Fi is coming in and out, sit back there, open your laptop, eat one of those Stroop waffles that United gives you and like try to do all that. Like that's actually getting to the point of 
empathy and clinical empathy. So you can go, man, I, I actually feel this. Like this, yeah. this sucks. Like what can I do to help support my friend who's going to go sit in that back seat? And that's the difference, right? Empathy and sympathy is like, that's the same word in many people's definitions, but that's not empathy. Empathy yeah. is being able to really experience it. And one, one way you do that, let's say you're selling to finance or you're selling to marketing or you're even selling to sales. Go talk to your VP of sales. Go look at their inbox and say, hey, prospecting message, show me your inbox and show me which ones stand out to you. Hey, marketing, same thing. Hey, mm -hmm. finance, what kinds of things are you like? You, you've got this opportunity. You've got these resources within your organization that we so little use to get to a level, level of clinical empathy that goes beyond, I hope things are okay in these trying times. Like <laughs> yeah. That, right. yeah, yeah. And let's face it. I mean, if another... Well, that's nice and it's polite and everything. I think people are so over and past that now, you know, because yeah. they realize, oh yeah, they're probably there going, yeah, wait, I just wait till Luke's going to do the COVID thing first, okay? <laughs> yeah, and then move. And yeah, no, and that's and I think in many ways, um, you know, as you said, is is a different approach and really trying to understand. And you won't understand unless you ask people about the circumstances of their business, the circumstances of themselves, the circumstances of their whole process, and all of that. You will never understand what's going on and you're right i think i think a lot of people confuse um sympathy for empathy because here's the other thing sometimes you can empathize with somebody but it doesn't mean you can't give them a a, a tough message either whereas if you sympathize with people you tend not to give them tough messages right that's true that's exactly right yeah. Well, this has been great. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your for your time today, Todd. Um, the book is called uh, The Transparency Sale. Um, all of Todd's information will be below this video and links to the book uh, and his other books, etc. Um, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. Oh, man, um, I'm uh, like we talked about, I'm a transparency nerd. Uh, all of my research is in behavioral and decision science, and I look at it through the lens of sales. Uh, so I wrote the book, The Transparency Sale. I'm also a sales history nerd. So if you're looking for something fun to follow along with, I publish just on Instagram and Twitter every day at sales historian, a quote or a picture or something from typically 90 to 140 years ago in the world of sales. And so that's my thing. But I also, I speak and teach. I just got done with the, uh, the sales kickoff circuit. Uh, that always happens here at the beginning of the year, but mm -hmm. uh, hopefully I can be a resource to uh, some of your companies. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, thanks again, Todd. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.